Well, this section in John 7 and 8 all takes place during the Festival of Tabernacles and Jesus is here in the temple courts teaching the people. I called the sermon that I preached on this section, I am the light of the world. If you're new to this channel, I encourage you to subscribe and you'll get notifications when future videos come out. I make a video like this for every passage that I preach in my local church. And I encourage you to share this with others who you think might find it useful. If you are coming to this passage and you haven't yet done the hard work of reading and rereading the text, I encourage you to stop this video and take some time to do that now to notice for yourself some of John's repetition. John has written in order to give us evidence about Jesus, evidence which calls us to believe in Jesus. And by believing in Jesus, we might have life through Jesus. And so go read through this passage. Look at the evidence that John gives us about Jesus. See what he's calling us to believe about Jesus, so that we might have life through his name. And spend some time praying that God would open your eyes to see wonderful truths about him. Now, as always, I'll highlight just some of what I've seen in this text. And really, this statement of Jesus is uh, the key, the heart of the whole passage, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Before we look at that in a bit more detail, I'm just going to highlight some of the repetition that I've seen in this text. And Jesus being the key character in this gospel is really the, the focus of this whole section. And I just want to single out a few of these uh, I am statements, which are worth looking out for in John's Gospel. They link us all the way back to Exodus chapter 3, where God introduced himself to Moses as I am, giving himself that personal name. And Jesus in John's gospel takes that name for himself. We've seen it already in John chapter 6. And here is the second explicit I am statement. I am the light of the world. But we see this I am language used by Jesus a number of times through this section. If you want to, you can go and chase down all these I am statements in John's gospel. And it's incredible just to see this big picture of who Jesus is claiming to be and the evidence that John gives us. Now, one very good reason to see this section following on straight after John chapter 7, without the story that is placed in between, you can go and do some research on that yourself to see why uh, most scholars believe that's not part of the original that John wrote. But this fits very neatly in with the end of chapter 7 because uh, Jesus is here teaching in the temple courts um, just like he was at the end of chapter 7. Chapter 7 ended with Jesus saying, uh, anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. And at this festival, the water pouring ceremony would have just taken place. And following that water pouring ceremony, there were four big lamps in the temple courts that were lit. Uh, you can go and read up about it in uh, the Jewish histories, where they say as those four lamps were lit on this last and greatest day of the festival, that light uh, beamed right ac across the whole city of Jerusalem. And with that scene happening, then Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He's making a huge claim here. Now, the Old Testament context for God being the light of his people is vast. You can go and look at uh, Psalm 27, verse 1, or Psalm 36, verse 9. Isaiah has a very rich um, picture of God being the light for his people. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. 42, verse 6. 49, verse 6. A key one, Isaiah 60, verse 19 to 22. Uh, you can look at uh, Zechariah 14, verse uh, 5, the second half of verse 5 to verse 7. There's rich Old Testament imagery waiting for the day 
that God himself will, would come to be the light for his people. So Jesus stepping in here and saying, I am the light is an incredible thing that Jesus is saying. Now, just to single out a few other characters, we also see uh, the Pharisees. And the Jews. We'll see Jesus says a whole lot in this section about his father, who, who they don't know who this father is. As I said in John, we've got, we're looking for evidence. John gives us a whole lot of evidence about Jesus. And we see that in uh, the, these words, witness in this section. He's saying kind of who they, they're questioning him whether this evidence that he's giving, saying that he's the light of the world, is that evidence true? Uh, can his testimony be trusted? And uh, that's because in their law, they required two witnesses, and they're saying, well, Jesus, you're witnessing by yourself. But just imagine a room completely in dark and light walks in. Does that light need any further witness to confirm that it's light? I know the fact that the darkness is dispelled uh, proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that this is light. And so Jesus actually didn't need further witness, but he does say that uh, the Father himself is a witness. And this evidence calls for people to believe. Evidence that's calling for belief. And in this section, Jesus says, but you do not believe. Uh, we see at the end, we're told that many believed. But in the next few verses, if you just go uh, and have a look at chapter 8, verse 31 and 37, we see uh, this belief is in question. Is it actually saving belief? Uh, but Jesus says uh, in verse 12 that whoever follows, and this idea links closely with the idea of belief. Uh, it's not just a mental ascent, but it's actually following Jesus, the light of the world, and if you do that, you will have the light of life. Because this evidence that John gives us is calling for belief in Jesus, and belief in Jesus leads to life through him. So Jesus makes this massive claim, I am the light of the world. He's saying he is the great I am. And he then calls people to follow him. So there's the claim, here's the call, follow him. And what's the promise? If you follow Jesus, the light of the world, you will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It is a glorious promise giving to the, given to those who follow Jesus. But tragically, like we saw in the whole of chapter 7, in this section and the next section, we see that most of the people hear this call. They see, they've seen the evidence, but they absolutely won't believe. They won't follow Jesus, the light of the world, and they don't receive life through his name. And Jesus shows them that the fact that they don't believe in him shows that they are judging by human standards. Uh, Jesus says that uh, he passes judgment on no one, but if he does judge, his decisions are true. And he says that he's not alone. He, the father is his other witness, uh, showing that he is who he says he is. But they then say, who is your father? And Jesus replies, well, you don't know me. We've heard that before from Jesus' lips uh, in the previous section where Jesus said, you have no idea who I am or where I am from. And he says here, uh, you don't know me. You don't know me or my father. He says, uh, you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. John gives us this little bit of information as uh, the author saying that Jesus spoke this while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. So, as I said just now, this was taking place on the greatest final day of this festival when these massive lights were lit and in the temple courts close to where the offering was put, one of these lights was right there. So Jesus is standing there with one of these huge lamps blazing, casting light over Jerusalem. 
and he says, I am the light of the world. The people don't believe his testimony about himself. But then we're told no one sees him because his hour had not yet come. Uh, Jesus' hour in John's gospel is uh, the time of his crucifixion. He spoke about his hour not coming already um, in John 2 verse 4, and John 4 verse 23, 5 verse 25, 7 verse 30. Jesus' hour was uh, still to come, and in Jesus' upper room discourse, uh, later in John's gospel, we hear him saying, the hour has now come when darkness reigns, when the light of the world would be crucified on the cross. But we're not there yet. And Jesus makes some other shocking claims to these religious Jews, the leaders of the church of that day. He says, you will die in your sins. I told you that you would die in your sins. Why? If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. So Jesus is saying, if you won't believe, if you won't see the evidence, you won't have this life. Rather, you will die in your sins. That is a tragic, tragic reality that these people would get to that day, one day, uh, where they'd stand before the Father and he would say, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And because they have no idea, they don't know who the Father is, we're told here, they still didn't understand. Jesus then says, well, one day you will understand. One day you will know. Then you will know. And when will they know? Well, it's when they've lifted up the sun. Now, we've already heard that. Uh, reference in chapter 3 of John's Gospel. And this idea of lifting up the Son of Man points us both to the cross, but also to Jesus being lifted up in glory, his glorification on his throne. So Jesus is saying one day, all the evidence will make it absolutely clear that he is indeed the light of the world. He is God with us. And the evidence will become absolutely clear when Jesus lifted up on the cross and lifted up to his throne in glory. But this evidence still calls for belief. So if they won't believe in Jesus, then they would die in their sins, rather than letting him die on the cross for their sins, so that they can walk, not in darkness, but in light forever. And so John gives us all this evidence about people getting it wrong, making the wrong call about who Jesus is. But right at the beginning, he told us how we should respond to Jesus. Because Jesus said, I am the light of the world, the absolutely glorious truth. Whoever follows me. That's the call of this passage. Follow Jesus. We heard this in chapter 1, where Jesus said to Philip, follow me. And we'll hear it right at the end of John's Gospel, in chapter 21, when Jesus says in his final words to Peter, follow me, keep following me. The idea is that those who follow Jesus need to follow Jesus through this life until they get to glory with him. And if you follow him, there's a glorious promise, you'll never walk in darkness. Psalm 23 says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And if we are following Jesus, then we have the light of the world with us. Even though we might walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't walk in darkness because we have the light with us. We have the light of life. And so this passage is a massive encouragement to those who will believe, those who follow Jesus. You'll never walk in darkness. But there's a massive challenge here for those who challenge Jesus who won't believe, who won't follow him, they end up continuing to walk in darkness. And one day they will die in their sins. And this crowd were those who then lifted up this Son of God on the cross, thinking that they had snuffed out the light of the world, but actually Jesus' light shone all the more brightly at that point, as his light shone into the darkness of our lives for those who believe in him. Our 
darkness and our sin is paid for on the cross. And because Jesus is seated on his throne in glory now, his light is shining into the hearts of those who believe in him. And we will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This really is a glorious passage for us to think about, reflect about further. So spend more time digging in, rejoicing in these truths. And as you teach it to others, I pray that they would be those who follow the light and never walk in darkness, that they see the evidence, that they believe in Jesus and find life through his name. Well, God bless as you dig in further.